Okay. <laughs> I think I'm live. Okay. Sorry about that. So YouTube has changed things around on the live streaming page and apparently there's these new steps I have to go through or I did it differently on a scheduled event page. I don't know. Anyway, I'll try to make sure that doesn't happen again. Okay. Good evening, everybody. How is everybody this evening? Did you all see my uh, appearance on Honey Badger Radio last night? That was pretty fun. That was exciting. And uh, thanks to all the new subscribers I have uh, I have uh, acquired from that show. I appreciate your subscriptions and. Uh, if you uh, donate or buy t-shirts or subscribe or like and comment on my videos, that is so much appreciated. You have no idea. So thanks again. So tonight, all right, we have a really interesting case actually that just came out of the Court of Appeal of Alberta. Um, of course, it's a sex crime case. Um, this uh, gentleman just won his appeal last week. Um, and uh, the main issue of this case is what's known as the WD test or what judges use to assess credibility. Uh, juries don't really use the WD test. The judge might give them instructions using the WD as the background, but it's just a precedent that the Supreme Court of Canada set, but it's not, nobody's bound by law to assess credibility or come to decisions using this particular test. Um, now, if the Crown submits that the judge uses the test, then I guess they have to, um, but uh, they don't have to anyway. So, in this, this is a particular case where the WD test was used and the argument was that it wasn't used properly to assess the credibility of the case. So this is going to be a two-part video. <clears throat> Tonight I'm going to just discuss the background of the case in this live stream, and then I'm going to make a video that is an explainer for what the implications are for future sex crime cases because of this appeal decision. This appeal decision is really groundbreaking. So, um, of course, there's always the opportunity, uh, the, the possibility that it might get... Um, appealed up to the Supreme Court of Canada, and the Supreme Court of Canada could potentially overturn this decision, which would render it useless. They could strike it down. Uh, but I personally think that's highly unlikely to happen. Uh, this was a three-panel appeal, uh, three-judge three appeal panel, and all three judges unanimously acquitted the man, well, overturned the conviction. They didn't acquit him. They overturned the conviction and called for a new trial. So they unanimously did that. So typically, if a case is going to be accepted by the Supreme Court, it's more likely to be accepted by the Supreme Court of Canada if there was a dissenting judge. So, for example, if one of the three judges said, I don't agree with the other judges' decisions and I would, I would um, uphold his conviction, then the Crown would win the uh, the right to appeal to the Supreme Court of Canada and it would become a case. But because that didn't happen and all three judges were unanimous, it's highly unlikely that the Supreme Court of Canada will even entertain this case. And even if he is retrialed and he, uh, sorry, retried and convicted, this judgment still stands as case law on the appeal levels. And which means that people can use this case law for their own case. Lawyers can use this case uh, to um, win an argument in, in favor of their uh, client. Um, and it's also, again, just, just good for general knowledge as to what's going on in our courts and how people are being con convicted and how convictions are being overturned. All right, so let me get to the background of the case. <clears throat> Uh, following a trial by judge alone, the appellant was convicted of sexual assault and sentenced to a period of 30 months imprisonment. That's two and a half years. And when you hear what it's for, your mind is going to just... Pfft. All right. So in 2000, 
so he appeals the conviction. The parties met <clears throat> at a music festival in central Alberta in July 2015. They chatted for a few hours in a field before moving to a nearby riverbank where they engaged in kissing and fondling. From there, they went to the appellant's tent, undressed, lay on a cot, and continued to caress and fondle one another. The complainant testified that they then moved into foreplay, by which she meant he performed cunnilingus on her with her consent. Following that, the appellant positioned himself over the complainant, intending to engage her in sexual intercourse. When the complainant advised that she did not want to have intercourse, the appellant stopped and shortly thereafter fell asleep. <clears throat> he testified that he woke up because the complainant was undulating against his thigh and the complainant testified that she was trying to get up off the cot and leave. Hmm. Two very different stories there. Once, <clears throat> once he awoke, they resumed kissing and fondling one another. He then again positioned himself over her to engage her in sexual intercourse. She said she objected, but he persisted and briefly penetrated her. He said that he stopped when she said no and did not penetrate her. Both agreed that immediately thereafter she dressed and left his tent. Before doing so, he apologized. She understood that he was apologizing for having briefly engaged her in intercourse. He testified that he apologized only for misreading the situation and thinking that she had changed her mind and wanted to have intercourse with him, but again was adamant that no actual intercourse had occurred. She returned to her tent where her friend was sleeping and later that morning complained to the RCMP. The police located the appellant and interviewed him. He told them what he told the judge at trial, that all of the sexual contact between them was consent consensual and that he did not ever penetrate the complainant with his penis. The appellant also immediately, upon RCMP request, provided a DNA sample. Oh, what a waste. Anyway, <clears throat> the complainant underwent a rape kit examination. You know, let me just pause here for a second. These rape kits, aren't they supposed to be for the purpose of identifying your rapist when you don't know who they are? I mean, when two people have consensual sex, there's no question they had sex. The only question is whether it was rape. How a rape kit and a DNA exam can prove that she was raped is, if you ask me, pseudoscience. I mean, if, if, if the only question here is if he ejaculated inside of her and he's saying, no, I didn't, then they want to probe her for, you know, for proof of that, that he did, okay, maybe that's one thing. But she didn't make the claim. At least it's not said here in this appeal. She did not make the claim that he ejaculated inside of her. So if she didn't make that claim, what the hell is the point of a rape kit? <clears throat> and you know, it's funny because there's so many, there's, there's all these groups of people who are complaining about untested rape kits sitting on shelves doing nothing. Well, here's a perfect example of why that is. They're a waste of resources, time, and money, quite frankly, in cases like this. Anyway, so the results of the forensic testing of those samples were not entered at trial and remain unknown. Well, there you go. So, you know, why? <laughs> because they didn't prove anything? Um, Again, that just goes to say that if, if her claim was that he ejaculated inside of her, then it should be used to prove it. But if she never made that claim, then the whole rape kit was a joke. It was pointless. So the only issue to be term determined at trial was whether the appellant had vaginal intercourse even momentarily with the complainant. In other words, a quick poke test. Can I go in there? Oh, no, she says no, better not. You know, that's basically what this is about, a poke test. So both parties agreed that all other sexual contact was consensual. The complainant and the appellant were the only witnesses at trial. There was no other evidence except that the appellant's, except the appellant's statement to the police, which was admitted at the Crown's request without a voir dire or objection from the defense. Okay, so the only witnesses here are him and her. 
and uh, one of the issues in typical in these trials is if the gentleman makes a statement to the police, um, should there be a hearing to disqualify that police statement from the trial? Because oftentimes things are said that are taken out of context or um, have nothing relevant or have no relevance to the issue at hand, but could be used against him. <clears throat> um, and apparently in this case, the defense lawyer uh, did not see any reason for his police statement not to go in as evidence. Um, also, you know, it gives the Crown the opportunity to cross-examine the, uh, the accused on both their police statement and their trial testimony and make comparisons. So they can do the same thing with the complainant and they can do that with the accused. But remember, in the court of law, the benefit of the doubt always goes to the accused and the accused person should never have to be proving their innocence. The onus should not be on them to prove their innocence. We want things to be equal, but in this case, it's not really equal when you're starting from a point where an innocent man has the entire state bearing down on him, accusing him of a horrific crime and he's facing years in prison. So in my personal view, I would have, if I were his defense lawyer, which I'm not a lawyer, but you know, I, I personally would have probably made a motion to have his police statement removed from evidence. <clears throat> Cause either you should never speak to the police at all or make a motion to have your police statement removed from the evidence. But then again, if it's a five minute statement and you really didn't say much, who cares really? So it doesn't matter. All right, moving on. So of significance, the complainant advised that she consumed two hits of LSD and a half a gram of MDA on the night in question. Now we're getting some interesting facts here. So she was high on LSD and MDMA. And I've never done MDMA, but from what I know about it, it uh, gives you a happy, euphoric, I love everybody, and you know it heightens your sensuality and all of your senses, and it makes you very affectionate. <clears throat> and that would be in line with his statement that he woke up to her undulating his thigh. You know, they were already really close. So she was, you know, doing the old, you know, I'm kind of horny thing and uh, he was like okay well let's uh, let's get on with this and then she says no 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 we can't do that well he stops but anyway she testifies that she takes the MDMA about an hour or two before arriving at the concert and then again later at midnight regarding the LSD she testified that she took the first tab between 10 and 11 and the other at about midnight as to the LSD, the complainant agreed that the drug had hallucinogenic effects, but asserted that it had never affected her memory. She also explained the nature of the hallucinations. Hmm. Okay, it might not affect your memory, but it sure as hell gonna affect your perception of things. So the hallucinations mainly just affect or enhance what's already there, she says. It's mainly just, I may be looking at this grain of wood and it's slightly moving. It might seem brighter, but I'm not seeing things that aren't there. I feel like I can still think rationally. The complainant also testified that tracer effects happen, which she describes as follows. So if I were to wave my hand like this, I would see, you know, I guess multiples of my hand for an instant. The complainant con continued on. Hallucinations, I guess, in terms of, you know, I'm not seeing anything that's not there. Like, I won't see, say, an elephant in the sky. You know, I'm not hallucinating things like that. I see what's already there. I just am seeing enhanced versions of what's already there. Ultimately, the complainant was asked, but it's fair to say when you're high on acid that you see things that aren't actually there, such as the example, your hand that moves. You see items or you see light or however you want to describe it, but you experience a sensation of events that aren't truly happening, correct? The complainant replied, in a way, I suppose. But there was no evidence as to the potentiating effect of LSD combine, combined with MDA. That's interesting that there was no evidence on the 
A, the combination of the effects of combination of LSD and MDA, nor was there evidence submitted just for the effects of MDMA. So the appellate testified that he had taken some nitrous oxide. He described inhaling the gas to get a momentary feeling of exhilaration with no other effect except perhaps a headache if too much is consumed. He also drank some alcohol throughout the night, but neither witness suggested he was any way intoxicated as a result. All right, so, you know, they're both intoxicated to some degree, but obviously she's a little more intoxicated. So the grounds of appeal for this uh, case were, one, the trial judge erred in law in failing to assess credibility in accordance with the WD test. Two, the trial judge misapprehended the evidence in a material respect. Three, the trial judge made impermissible use of the complainant's prior consistent statement. And four, the trial judge erred in law in his application of the principles set out in Lifkus. All right, so in this case, as far as I know, the appeal panel only entertained the first ground of appeal, the WD. This whole thing just revolves all around that. They, they ignored these other appeals grounds and just focused on this one. And I will be putting a link up at the top of this video um, to the WD case uh, analysis that I did. Uh, a couple of years ago, I made a video called Why WD Should Over Be, Must Be Overturned. And um, I criticize it um, and compare it actually to this other case mentioned here, Lifkus. Um, because they're both legal precedents that have to do with the reasonable doubt, the standard of proof, credibility assessment, and bias. Um, they're all, they're both intermingled and intertwined and judges often misapply them either together or separately. So with this case, um, it focuses on WD and it actually makes a really good argument for it that I don't think I made in my, in my movie, in my video. Um, this really breaks down the, the true problem with the WD test and why it's such a problem and why it can result in wrongful convictions. Um, so I'm just going to start off with um, a little bit of this, but I'm not going to read the whole judgment, but uh, just to give you some background on where the judge's minds are and why they are not happy with this precedent, this, why they agree with this appeal. So whether WD was properly considered and applied is perhaps the most popular ground of appeal arising from criminal trials. On reflection, that cannot be a surprise. The formula proposed in R versus WD is, if applied, verbatim and without explanation, misleading and confusing. Both jurists and academics have criticized the formula as inadequate. Professor Don Stewart has gone so far as to suggest that in light of the confusion and complexity it has generated, it is time for the Supreme Court to bite the bullet and firmly abandon WD and indicate that this troublesome formula should not be used. So that's the crux of this entire appeal. WD sucks ass and it needs to go. Now this is not the Supreme Court of Canada, so they're basically laying out the framework if this case were to go to Supreme Court of Canada, they'd be specifically asked to abandon WD or rewrite WD. So they go on about the problems with WD and again I'm going to make another video that sort of encapsulates their arguments and uh, the implications because it's pretty comp complex and it's very important. So yeah, um, so I'll analyze that in another video. But going back to the application in this case, they do explain, I'm just going to get to that. Um, so application to the present case. I turn now to consider whether the trial judge erred in his resolution of the conflicting evidence. The reasons for judgment began with a recital of the three-pronged test enunciated in WD without elaboration, and it was not referred to again. The sole issue to be determined at trial was whether actual intercourse occurred. 
the evidence <clears throat> of the complainant and the appellant as to their sexual activities on the night in question was generally consistent except as to whether intercourse occurred. Both agreed that all of the other sexual contact was consensual and that when the complainant initially asked the appellant to stop as he attempted to have intercourse with her, he did stop and following some conversation fell asleep. Both also agreed that once he awoke, they resumed their intimacies. The only material disparity has to do with the appellant's response to the complainant's protests when he again positioned himself to have intercourse with her. The complainant testified that she was trying to leave and was actually extricating herself from the narrow cot on which both were lying when the appellant awoke and resumed kissing her, activity to which she consented. She said that when the appellant again attempted intercourse, she said no and struggled to no avail, and when he stopped shortly thereafter, she got up and dressed. As she was dressing, he apologized and she gave him an angry look. As she tried to leave the tent, he momentarily blocked her path, then let her pass. <sighs> angry. She was angry. What is it with these women? You get angry at them for something, and then you go running to the police. That's terrible. So the appellant testified that he awoke because the complainant was undulating against his leg. That caused him to think that she may have changed her mind about not wanting to engage in intercourse. So he resumed kissing her and eventually repositioned himself to have intercourse, but when the complainant protested, he stopped without penetrating her. He said she then quickly got up, dressed, and seemed weirded out, so he apologized. But he insisted that the apology was only for trying to have intercourse a second time, as he thought that that was the reason she was upset, she having told him earlier that she did not want to do that. Well, neither scenario was obviously implausible or impossible. Indeed, the impellent's account was consistent with his prior respectful and responsive conduct toward the complainant. The outcome of the case depended solely on a correct assessment of the witness's credibility and reliability. Ultimately, the trial judge accepted the complainant's evidence. The complainant's abrupt and angry departure from the tent was pivotal to his reasoning, which was... However, something happened at the second incident which so upset her that she abruptly left in an emotional state such that he recognized her distress and apologized. That something was sexual intercourse. Nothing in her time with him upset her as it did this time. This is not a case of him trying a second time and upsetting her because of it to the point that she abruptly dressed and angrily left. They had enjoyed a number of hours together, including a time of intense sexual intimacy, short of sexual intercourse. She fully participated without any upset on her part. She had drawn the line, however, at intercourse without being upset on her part when he first tried. The trial judge summarized his reasonings thus. Considering the whole of the evidence here from their meeting, the time they spent together, the sexual activity that they enjoyed together, and the discussion they had about her limits, there was no reason for them to end as they did, except that he went beyond the limits that she had set. Those were the trial judge's reasons. Now back to the appeal court, they say, with respect to the trial judge's reasoning on this crucial point is troubling because the complainant's abrupt departure was equally supportive of both the appellant's and the complainant's testimony. The complainant may have left as suddenly as she did because intercourse had occurred against her will or because she was upset that the appellant tried again to have intercourse even after she had made it clear she did not want that. Given the fundamental ambiguity of this evidence, and its pivotal role in the trial judge's reasoning, it was incumbent on the judge to consider and explain why the appellant's equally plausible account for the complainant's sudden departure was not true and did not raise even a reasonable doubt. The respondent rightly points out that, the general, that generally where material evidence conflicts, the trial judge's explanation for accepting one version will implicitly and sufficiently explain why the opposing version is rejected and that no more is required. I agree, but I am concerned. Oh, by the way, let me back up there. This case, R versus MRE, also known as R versus REM. This is a deadly 
precedent that is used in many, many sex crime cases. It basically, as this says, um, the trial judge's explanation for accepting one's version is sufficient um, to explain why the other version is rejected and no more is required. So basically, the judge can use the w judges will use this precedent to say, I accept her version, and R versus REM or MRE tells me that. I only need to uh, reject his evidence based on the fact that I accept hers and I need to give no further explanation. This is a very, this is another one I, I am meaning to get around doing a video on. <clears throat> so the appeal panel agrees with this sentiment, but they go on to say that I'm concerned that in the unique circumstances of this case, more was required. This was a case in which both parties offered almost identical accounts of their interaction on the night in question, differing only on whether intercourse occurred. There was no other evidence and thus nothing to corroborate either version and no obvious reason to disbelieve either. As noted, the appellant cooperated fully with the police and provided his DNA immediately upon request. His testimony generally and on the critical issue was not such that it could be dismissed as obviously foolish or false. His account stood up under cross-examination. While the appellant admitted to consuming nitrous oxide much earlier, giving him only a momentary rush, there were no concerns about the reliability of his testimony. But at the same time, there were significant concerns about the effect of the complainant's use of drugs on her reliability of the story. The complainant had taken two tabs of LSD as well as some MDA, MDMA. She testified that when she took LSD, she would not hallucinate in the sense of seeing elephants in the sky, but she would experience sensory hallucinations such as seeing grains of wood move and breathe and light tracers following a moving object. She testified that the effects of LSD would usually last six to eight hours. As she took the last tab of LSD at about midnight, the effect of the drugs may have significantly overlapped the alleged event, which was estimated to have occurred between 5 and 7 a.m. While the trial judge found that her drug use did not affect her perception of what happened in the test, the WD test, he acknowledged that she may not have been completely sober. Also of concern, there was also no evidence before the court as to whether the combination of LSD and MDMA might have had a potentiating effect. And in such circumstances, the trial judge's reasons warrant close scrutiny. Those reasons turned on the interpretation of an ambiguous event, the complainant's abrupt and angry departure. That this evidence was equivocal and equally supportive of both the complainant's and the appellant's testimony appears not to have been contemplated. In my opinion, the trial judge needed to consider whether, in light of the ambiguous nature of the evidence upon which he was relying, the appellant's account may be true. His failure to do so was fatal to the conviction. On this evidence, it was not enough to simply accept the evidence of the complainant and by that process reject that of the appellant. So by them saying that her evidence was equally as plausible as his evidence, what that says, and they discuss it earlier in uh, the breakdown of the WD, is that you have two pieces of evidence on one crucial issue that conflict with each other, but when you uh, break, break it down and you determine that each piece of evidence is equally reliable, you basically, you have balanced scales at this point, right? Balanced scales. Now, with that in mind, you, you know, the evidence, let's see, do I look balanced? All right. <laughs> so the evidence is equal at this point for both sides. But remember what I, what I said at the beginning of this, and that is that every case always starts with the benefit of the doubt toward the accused. So in this case, because the the evidence essentially canceled each other out. It was neutral. So you have a balance of evidence and therefore 
you have to end it there and give the benefit of the doubt to the accused person and acquit. That is what should have happened. Now these appeal judges say that in so many words, um, but yet they still call for a new trial, which sucks ass because yeah, that's uh, that means everything starts all over for this guy again. <laughs> and that's that's costly. But now you have an idea, maybe you might have a better understanding of how judges weigh credibility and how easy it is to make a, a serious mistake doing it and to forget that the presumption of innocence is always paramount. The benefit of the doubt always starts with the accused. The accused person always starts as an innocent accused person until the evidence just, you know, it, it just becomes weighed down so heavily against him that they can find him guilty. And this is a classic case where that wasn't the case. It was neutral, canceled each other out. Therefore, pff, you know, he might have done a poke test. He might not have done a poke test. But you know what? The evidence, I can't convict him. So that's what should have happened. So this case is really important, and I hope that anybody that comes along and, and sees this, you know, finds uh, some solace with this case, because this is a, a really good decision. And if you actually take the time to read the whole decision, it's really well written, really eloquent. And uh, yeah, so let me see if there's any, uh, okay. Oh, hang on guys, I'm gonna see if you have so chat. Whoops, okay. <clears throat> hey, Phyllis Raider, Sean, from a balmy negative 28 degrees Celsius. Oh my God, where are you? <laughs> it's not that cold here in Toronto, that's for sure. Hey, Mark, did you miss it again? Oh, well. <laughs> um, you can watch the replay later. Uh, Cuck Nora says, I had hallucinations uh, similar to LSD when I took MDMA, undulating walls. Hmm. Interesting. Undulating walls. Cheers, TJO. Oh, Sean Doherty. Uh, let's see, where is that? Is sucks ass a Latin term? <laughs> yeah. Sure is. Okay, I'm going to I'm going to try and pop this uh chat out here so I can see it better. Let's see. Okay, there we go. <laughs> okay. She's high on drugs that makes her horny so she leads a dude on with a BJ and some humping of his leg. How does a judge find a poke test is worth 30 months for a miscommunication? <laughs> yeah. Two and a half years for I mean God, it is outrageous, Chris Russ. I know, right? Totally outrageous. Um, talking and being honest with the police does not work to your benefit. It gets you convicted. Yeah, so in this case, his police statement was submitted as evidence and it didn't help him, even though he was being honest. Yeah. Even, even if I accept all she claims is true, how did this end up in court? So much for the accusation police don't take complaints seriously. I know, right, Mark? Um, and the thing is, this has been going on for years. It's nothing new, right? It's a joke when people say that police don't take accusations, complaints seriously. Well, I got a whole database full of these cases. And this is a more recent one. So they've been pressured to take cases that should never have been taken seriously to actually take them seriously. And this is what we have. We have wasted court time, wasted resources, and at the detriment of innocent men's lives. Um, it's terrible. The police have all kinds of tricks that they can legally use to undermine you. Yeah, I know. Basically, handing your case to a crown attorney when they don't have to is um, one of them. <laughs> yeah, innocent until proven guilty seems long gone. I hope it's not, but damn, some of these cases. I know, right, Ma Lark? Yeah. Um, the innocent innocence until proven guilty, it still lurks around in our justice system. It's still there. It's still a pillar. 
Uh, but the problem is, is that there's this big, giant crowd of people at the base of this pillar right now that are hiding it. And they've all got these megaphones. And, well, they're feminists and victims' rights advocates and sexual assault advocates. And right now, uh, they're blocking the view to this pillar. But I have hope that eventually this crowd will be dispersed and they'll be dealt with and sent, sent away. And uh, reason will come back to the courts. I have hope, but, you know, I could be wrong. But I guess that's just me looking at the silver lining. I think judges are scared, especially after Robin Camp. Some could be, sure, yeah. But th they have the power to make a really strong decision that can't be overturned. So um, uh, they should use it because I've seen really good acquittals. Uh, like, exa for example, the case, the Judge Robin Camp case, he acquitted that man, um, but when the feminist crowns uh, sent his case, uh, appealed the case and sent it, ordered a new trial, got a new trial, it went back to trial under a new judge, and the judge also acquitted the same guy. So this poor guy was dragged through trial. This innocent accused guy was dragged through trial twice and because of these angry feminists that were angry at some, you know, knees together comment that the judge made. And uh, anyway, the, the judges that acquitted him on the sec the judge that acquitted him the second trial, he had some really strong words at the bottom of his of his uh, verdict. Basically, you know, acknowledging that public pressure should not result in wrongful convictions. We should not let public pressure result in wrongful convictions. And that was a beautiful thing that he did. And nobody touched that judgment. It, it stays as is. I would be interested in that database of those cases. Are they available for download somehow? Uh, Ma Lurk, good question. Um, I used to have it online, but... Uh, don't anymore. Um, I need to get it up online. Uh, right now it's, um, it's in a Excel spreadsheet. <laughs> so I, uh, basically I need to figure out a way to get it back up online because it's got a lot of data tables horizontally. So it's a pretty wide table. Um, and I need to find the perfect solution to be able to present it on a web page. Um, so maybe if you have any ideas or if anybody has any ideas as to how I can do that. Um, also, if, if you're interested in the Excel file that I have, um, I might be willing to share it with you. Um, why don't you drop me an email? You can, you can email me uh, through my website at uh, socialtheorywatch.org or through YouTube to the same uh, socialtheorywatch at gmail.com. Um, let me know your particular interest in the database and I uh, might be able to work something out because I might have to make some edits to it to remove some code that I have in it from the last time I had it in an HTML format. So, Chris Riss, you did a great job on HBR. Oh, thanks. That was, that was fun. That was pretty crazy. <laughs> um, yeah, that was, that worked out. That was, gr that was great. Yeah. They reached out to me two years ago to do that. And, uh, we finally, we finally all got our shit together. <laughs> Wagner won again. Yeah. Thanks, Sean. That was his name. I think it was Wagger. W-A-G-G-A-R, if I remember correctly. But yeah, he was, he was acquitted times two, which is just the most ridiculous thing. It's just ridiculous. So, um, let's see. I think I have a link to this case underneath this video um, in the description bar. And let's see. I'm going to put it in the chat anyway if you guys want it. Okay. Let's see. So, other than that, if you guys have any other questions. Oh, where is it? Oh, I know where it is. It's in this pop-up thingy. Where is it? Oh, there it is. Okay. 
All right, so there's a direct link to the case if you guys wanted to capture that real quick. All right, it's also in the description of the video. Um, and if you are new to my channel and watching this for the first time and you enjoyed this, please subscribe. Would love that, appreciate that. Um, yeah, also uh, check out my website. Um, check out uh, the merchandise that I have for sale the books that I recommend for reading to understand this stuff more, we're at the root of it all, um, and my uh, blog posts. <clears throat> Second question. What are Canadian dollars in the donate, just American dollars? Oh, um, well, it's Cana it, it, the, if it says Canadian $5, um, I believe it converts to Oh, you know what? That's a good question. <laughs> I'm not sure, actually. Uh, I don't know if it actually converts for me um, Canadian $5 versus US $5. But if you are paying with um, uh, American funds, then it would do the conversion and I would, I would get the Canadian version. So if it was $5, then it would be like $7.50 or whatever. That's how it would show up in my account. I hope that answers your question. But I don't see the I don't see the credit cards or you know uh, the uh, the finances behind the people making the donations. So I don't know if they're paying in U.S. or Canadian funds. But because it's a Canadian website and I'm Canadian, whatever, I just set it to default to be Canadian dollars. Uh, Subscribe Star is working now. Apparently, do you have any plans to join there? I think I did start up an account, but they don't have. Uh, any payment processors um, so if you're saying it's working now apparently if you mean that they have reinstated PayPal or Stripe or something like that um, I might consider it um, but honestly it's just another platform that I have to manage so I'm really not all that excited but if I get a lot a lot of requests for it and people want to subscribe like you know manage all of those their subscriptions in one place I might consider it um, would it be easy to link to the Wagger case? Uh, yeah, um, I might have actually updated, added a link to it on my Judge Robin Camp video. I might have put an update in the description bar. You can check that. But let me, hold on a second, find, okay. Um, R versus Wagger. I'll do a quick search for it okay maybe it was 1g there it is uh 2017 this might be it A assist what assistant chief judge <laughs> wow they they put a top judge on this case too assistant chief judge yeah final comments before I conclude, I wish to make a final comment concerning this case. This matter has drawn much interest from the community as a whole, rightly so, given the comments of the trial judge during the first trial proceeding. There has been deserved sympathy engendered for the complainant from the community as a consequence of what was said, and the fact that she has been required to publicly describe these difficult events a second time. The trial judge and consequently the court and the administration of justice have been criticized by some segments of society and many have asserted that the complainant has suffered an injustice by the manner in which the court process unfolded in the first trial in this case. I take no issue with any of those concerns. However, none of those considerations mean that the case now before this court can be proven by evidence of a lesser quality and weight and none of those things mean that evidence is to be scrutinized to a lower standard than is required in all criminal cases. And none of those factors change the presumption of innocence and the duty of the Crown to prove the case beyond a reasonable doubt. As I have indicated aforesaid, that requirement was not met by the Crown in this case, thus the accused's acquittal. So that last paragraph there, pretty strong words but I'll grab the link for you. It's already been cited by three documents, which means three people have used it possibly for an appeal. 
All right. Let's, um, oh wait, chat. Okay. Alrighty. Um, there you go, Fillerator. There's a link to the Wagger case for you. <laughs> Being a Eurotard. Oh, Molark. Oh, cool. You're. Are you in Europe? Uh, y R T G. Oh, why are so many of you Canadian? So many of who? <laughs> Do you want to elaborate, Chris Russ? <laughs> um, yes, these are Canadian cases. Uh. I focus mainly on Canadian cases, but um, because the Canadian justice system. But if somebody has a special request and they want me to focus on a specific American case, you can let me know. And I, I do read them occasionally for various reasons. Um, but I, you know, I'm willing to potentially entertain them. And if it's if I find that it's of significant value uh, in terms of serving the public, then I might, you know, do a live stream or a video on it as I do occasionally with like acts that are trying to be passed in the US, like the Abby Honnold Act and stuff. Okay. Why are so many female MRAs Canadian? Oh, <laughs> well, you know, I've said this before, but I don't really label myself an MRA, although obviously I am defending men's rights when it comes to the fact that it's mostly men who are being wrongly and falsely accused and wrongly convicted of sex crimes um, due to, you know, the feminist theories and whatever. So I don't know if so many females, uh, I honestly, I have no idea. Maybe, maybe, I don't know. That's a good question. I really wish I had an answer for that. <laughs> yep. I'm the European version of Canadians, a Dane. Oh, cool. Danish. So, all right. Alrighty guys. So yeah. Um, hey, I don't know if you're, uh, if you read Danish cases or not, but, pff, you know, if, if, if they're uh, translated into English, I might be willing to read them, but, um, <laughs> the most prominent MRAs are female. Well, I don't know. Women can be pretty strong, but, um, there's some pretty strong men out there, male voices too. There really are. I mean, look at Brian Martinez from HBR. He's awesome. Um, and uh, Elam, Paul Elam. But he, you know, he's caught a lot of flack, though. Um, I don't study him intently, so I don't really know what all the controversy is around him. But from what I have seen, like from the movie The Red Pill, I mean, he seems like a pretty normal guy with some strong views. But hey, I've got some pretty strong views, too. Um, you know, but why is he, you know, the one being, you know, lambasted for potentially having the same view as me, right? So, I don't know. Yeah. Cassie from End Feminism? No, not me. I don't, I don't really study feminists a lot. Um, only in the legal sense, like the crowns or maybe psychologists and psychiatrists. Uh, I do watch them because they're dangerous too. <clears throat> but um, I'm pretty much, I pretty much operate in my own little bubble. <laughs> um, I think it's probably best for me to keep it that way uh, so that I can stay focused on, on all, you know, keep a focus, right? So everybody knows what to expect from me. Um, and it's really the only thing that I pretty much want to focus on anyway is the legal aspect. Um, yeah, so, all right, guys. Well, thanks again. And a couple more chance, a couple more seconds for any more questions. And we'll end it here for the night. All right, guys. Have a great night. And hopefully you're all staying nice and warm as winter comes back. Because it was really warm here. But now it's cold again. All right. Paul Elam is a shit slinger. All right. He says offensive things on purpose. <laughs> um, Danish cases are rarely translated to English. Paul Elam is pretty cool. He just reverses the worst articles made by feminist organizations. He always ends with pointing. Elam's greatest weakness is his illusion of strength. 
Oh, and why he wrote this and that he does not believe it. Do I know about M EMDR? Yes. Uh, I talk a little bit about that in some of my content. Um, uh, something I, I sensory, eye sensory movement stuff. I can't remember what, what it stands for, but, uh, that is a topic that I discuss when I'm talking psychology in some of my other content, but I'll probably touch on that at some point. But, uh, Cuck Norris, if you have any questions about, and, uh, if you have any specific things you want to say, or you want me to research on EMDR, um, let me know in a comment section or you can email me. Okay. All right, guys. All right. Thank you. And I'm going to say good night now. Take care.